Hi, welcome back to the shop. Um, this time I wanted to talk about my lathe. I get really a lot of questions in the comments about this machine and I just wanted to address a few of them. And also I wanted to show you what I did to this lathe, how it started out and uh, yeah, just give you an overview of it. Um, first of all I have a picture um, where you can see the um, how it looked before I did uh, the uh, refinish of this machine. It started out as a 9 by 20 inch or uh, 250 millimeter by 550 millimeter. That's um, 250 of uh, capacity on diameter and 550 between centers. It came with a multi-fix, 40 position tool post that's very common here in Germany but um, the size A I got on the machine is almost a, big, a bit too big for this machine so I changed later over to this um, Swiss made 3 pound tool post holder. The machine was usable out of the box. I, I set it up, I set up the headstock so it's, it's ter it was turning cylindrical and I used it for about four years without major problems. But then I decided to go full, full ahead and uh, do a complete rebuild of this machine. And that's what we have here. I, I re-scraped all the guideways in the top slide, cross slide and in the bed slide. Or um, yeah, I scraped one side and the other side is, um, is coated with a um, with an epoxy, a slideway epoxy called uh, Mugli's made by Diamond. I will link uh, that product down in the description of the video. Um, also the headstock is sitting on a special steel filled epoxy um, between the headstock and the machine's bed and that's, um, that's what used for alignment. So. Let's get a bit closer and take a look at uh, the machine. Okay, first of all I wanted to take a look at the carriage, the cross slide and the top slide. Um, these 9x20 lathe all have a problem with the top slide mount. The original top slide mount, which I have a picture here, those mounts are crap. They lack stiffness in every way. So. I decided to build this way more robust um, support plate which holds the, the top slide and I will remove it so you can see how it works. As you can see there are two bolts, one in front and one in the back. And by loosening these you enable it to rotate. Um, of course, because the bolts don't uh, rotate with the top slide, there is a limited range of motion and to go beyond 30 degrees you have to take the bolts out, rotate it farther and there is a, a bolt pattern down there and you can just go into the next pair of holes. And so I can get angles I can rotate this thing 360 degrees and also clamp it. Okay, let's uh, take these bolts out and pull out the... Okay, this is a pretty tight fit. Okay, got it out. Um, this is the top slide. It has this... It has this disc here screwed to the base to the lower top slide um, guideway and we'll take this over to a bench and take a closer look okay 
Um, I made a new bearing block here out of aluminum and originally the spindle of the top slide only ran in plain bearings or in fact there was just a hole in a piece of steel and uh, that was the bearing. I put two deep roof radial um, ball bearings into this aluminum housing and um, now it operates very very nice um, by turning the you can, this this just this one is way nicer and also by um, giving me here some relief I got about um, 50 millimeters more travel out of this top slide also you see that there are uh, five adjustment screws for the gib and originally there were um, three and because the gib is pretty thin I decided to go for five and give it more support and that result is a bit more rigidity. If we look here in the front you see that I made a new gib the original gib was almost uh, only half the thickness of this one and I made one that fits with about 500 of a millimeter play between the top slide itself and the, um, the lower guide piece. And now if we crank this uh, a bit to the front yeah, you can see this thing now uh, has quite a lot of travel. Uh, okay. And here you can see the black guideway epoxy. Um, there are pockets milled into the into the guideway and then this epoxy is cast in and in fact I cast it on the surface plate of uh, my granite surface plate um, with a with an, um, wax with a, with a mold release um, to form an absolute flat surface on these two sliding surfaces and um, I just scraped in very light. Um, I flaked the surface with the hand scraper to give me um, oil clearance or clearance for the oil. These surfaces are coated and the mating surfaces down here are scraped. And that's the proper way to do it with Mugli's. You can scrape or grind the mating surfaces. On the dovetail you can see that this surface is coated and the mating surface in here is again scraped. Also this surface is scraped and the mating surface on the gib is again coated. And I have I think I have pictures of this process and I will show you them now. Okay here we have the um, the top slide with the milled out pockets and in the next picture you see that I filled the pockets with the Mugli's epoxy and dropped it on my granite surface plate and also I weighted it down with some pieces of steel to let it sit flat on my surface plate and after you release it from the surface plate you need it needs a good hit with a dead blow hammer from the side to release it from the um, from the surface plate. Um, you see the surfaces from the that are cast off the surface plate and they are very precise. And um, this whole process with the um, casting uh, and um, surfacing of the with, with a slideway epoxy like um, the diamond mudlis that's out of the world of big machines. The real big machines, uh, vertical milling machines and horizontal boring machines and stuff like that, they 
almost all of them have um, have somewhat of a of a coating on their slideways. May it may be turkite, which comes as a sheet material that is glued on, or the um, SKC slideway epoxy or the diamond epoxy, which are cast in or injected into um, uh, machine pockets. Okay, next thing is this mounting plate. This is the mounting plate for the top slide and it's already uh, dirty. But that's the reason why we take that stuff apart from time to time. And it's held down with four bolts on the T-slots of the cross slide. And as you can see, um, I attempted to um, to brown or um, to blacken these pieces with a chemical blackening compound, and it uh, came out pretty ugly. Um, the top surface is also scraped, but you can see it were bad because of the browning. And I made extra long T-slot nuts because these T-slots in the cross slide are a bit um, wimpy. And I have seen lace like this where the T-slots were bent up. During a crash with a parting tool, the T the, um, this material up here was bent up and I wanted, <coughs> didn't want to take any chances of bending my T-slots on the lathe. I'm not going to um, pull off the top slide, uh, cross slide. Um, it's almost the same like the top slide. I got a row of way more um, adjusting screws than the original one. I have I made a way thicker um, gib, and also the sliding surfaces are um, coated. Also, this um, the cross slide surface is scraped flat, so it's um, in line with the spindle axis, and the front this face is also scraped because I can use it for aligning when I use the lathe for boring or milling operations. What I do um, pretty often, I use it a lot for boring or line boring especially. And again, um, for the, the bed slide, also I milled out the slideways of the um, of the bed slides, milled them out, aligned everything, and cast them off the machine's bed with the diamond epoxy, with the Moglis. Now for the headstock. Um, the headstock had a problem, um, or I think all Chinese lathe has these problems. The bear, they have two bearing seats, one in front, one in back. Um, there are tapered roller bearings in them, and um, they don't line up. They, they just can't machine two bearing seats that line up, it seems and I decided to machine out the I machined out the front and the rear bearing seat on the CNC milling machine. I cut a big hole in there. I have a picture there. And then I machined on the on a friend's lathe a cartridge, a cartridge spindle. It's just a piece of steel, a round steel piece, bearing seat in front, bearing seat uh, in the back, and that, and I glued that piece into my headstock with Loctite, with the Loctite 648 um, 
bushing retaining glue and uh, with, with the big um, glue surface I got there this is never going to move again. Okay this is the drive train on the back side normally there is a back gear a with a, a toothed belt up here and then you can change over this um, this V belt to the back gear and run it at very low speeds. I got rid of the back gear because um, I upgraded the motor to 0.75 um, kilowatts and run it on a VFD and this enables me to get down to 50 rpm and ha still have pretty much um, torque. This is I have a vector vector drive um, VFD in there, and that gives me a lot of torque on the lower rpms. And um, because there is just the motor, the idler wheel, and the spindle with the pulley. Uh, the lathe is not very, um, it, uh, it's not very loud, it's, run, it's running pretty smooth. And also, down here there is the banjo from the change, change gears for threading. And I have that disengaged almost all the time. So I don't have all these gears uh, rattling around in there all the time. Only when I need it for threading. Okay, we're back here on the electrical cabinet and there is not much in it. There is a Omron MX2 variable frequency drive. I like that very much. That's, that's a nice unit to set up and um, I got the software and the cable with it to um, set the parameters with the notebook. That's very nice. Um, other from that there is a main switch back here that powers the machine up and up here is a fan to provide cooling for the VFD um, there is just a relay um, um, a board with two relays on and that's for the uh, momentary buttons on to control the VFD and also I have a um, a 12 volt power supply down here if I ever have to run a, um, a pump or a, a machine light or anything like that on 12 volts and apart from that there is not much electrical stuff on this machine just the drive and some stuff around it to make it go there we have the chart with the spindle RPM. This is back gear which I got rid. I made the sign before I decided to get rid of the um, the um, back gear. So this doesn't count. I have direct drive in the lower range, zero to thousand RPM. Medium range is zero to uh, fifteen hundred RPM and. The highest uh, setting is 0 to 3000 RPM. Most of the time I have it set at um, 0 to, to 930. That gives me a full range of speeds I need for most of my operations. Up here I have the uh, controls. I have uh, forward, stop, which acts also as an emergency stop. It's just a momentary button, it's not, um, uh, it does not stay in position. And there is a reverse. And up here we have the potentiometer for the spindle speed. Um, that's the lowest. And as you can see, it has quite a lot of torque. It's really hard to, to stop this and on this big diameter I have with my hands a lot of torque but the VFD, the, um, the vector drive pushes in current into the motor just to keep it going. It feels the load and then it, it 
push us on. And that's it's really it's strong enough for my needs and it goes up. to a full stop. Um, the clickering noise you hear is the crappy belt I have on there. I don't have a DRO on this machine um, and I don't need a DRO on a lathe. I like a DRO on the milling machine but um, on a lathe I'm fine with dial, dial indicators. And um, this is what I use most of the time to set up right on the right side of the bed slide I have my um, 50 millimeters or um, 2 inch dial indicator um, that has seen better days but is still accurate and I have a mount that I can lock in place with this uh, lever it has this this mount is just um, it has a weed on top here and a clamping plate down here and it holds the, um, the dial test dial indicator and you can move it up to your uh, to the bed slide lock it set your number and then by moving the bed slide you can read your uh, your numbers or your travel. Um, there is this notch, this, this big round cutout. This is because normally um, this holder I made to be on the left side of the bed slide and the um, dial of the indicator would go right in there. It would sit in there like that but um, I discovered that the dial indicator directly under the chuck is a pretty bad idea. Um, it's in the way all the time, hot chips land on the um, lens there. I ruined one dial indicator that way and also oil on the, um, on the plunger is not very good for a dial indicator. So. I started to use it the other way. I mount it that way and I'm far enough away from the chuck so my dial indicator doesn't get any crap on it. And um, I like this setup. Um, maybe I will make but of course with this cutout I lose um, about 20 mm of travel of the indicator. Um, I will need to get a long tip so I can reach in wider and get my 50, full 50 mm of travel of this indicator. Apart from that I'm very happy with that setup and it works very fine and it's easy to push out of the way. Okay, and now maybe for the most radical modification on this lathe, the tailstock. Uh, I wanted to have a capstan wheel with a rack and pinion action for drilling, like this, like on a drill press, with the, with the rack and pinion on the quill. And I wanted to have it on the lathe too. And this is what I came up with. Um, I took the original quill and I bought a piece of round rack. I turned them down, glued and pinned them together so they are one piece. And I made this um, bearing block, bearing block, which holds um, the shaft with the um, rack with the pinion and runs into wall bearings. And that setup gives me about, not only is it much more stable because the quill, which is that long, that long here, uh, is always fully supported. 
it also gives me way way more travel. I have about 105 millimeters of travel on this lathe with, the, with this setup. Um, I think I got even a bit more if I move the stop back here. Yeah, I got a bit more. I got um, 120 millimeters of travel. Um, also, I changed the clamping uh, mechanism down here. I was sick of the wrench down here, and I don't, I didn't want to build something with a quick action lever and the cam action because um, the bed is pretty rough on the underside, and you need, I need quite a lot of travel to clamp this uh, tailstock in every position. What I did is I took a piece of um, left hand Acme screw with a pitch of 4mm, 4mm of travel per revolution and um, I machined, I, I made the, the clamping screw for the tailstock out of this Acme screw and I took a fitting left hand Acme nut and made the lever out of it. And with a um, quarter of a turn, I can go from fully locked, absolute safely locked, to completely loose. Because with a quarter turn, uh, I get about one millimeter of travel, and that's more than plenty. Um, back here, I have the ejector to uh, remove the tool out of the Morse taper because normally you crank the tailstock back and um, the spindle of the, of the quill pushes out the Morse taper tool but this uh, tailstock doesn't have a, a spindle anymore so I made this ejector and this is in fact just a... Um, I will pull it out a long screw that pushes on the end of the Morse taper tool. It has a 12 by 1 millimeter fine thread back here and a handle. Also, I machined a hex head on it if I ever got a tool stuck in it and I really need to um, grab it with a wrench to get more torque. So that's how I remove my tools out of the quill. Just like this, just with a quarter turn of this knob back here. Back it off, clean the Morse taper tool and there you go. I saw this clamping mechanism on a Haas TL2, uh, TL2 lathe of a friend and it's a pretty, it's a, it's a very nice design. This works very well. It doesn't distort the position of the quill when you're locking it. Um, the original clamping was just a, um, there was a, a, a draw bolt in there and that pinched the quill sideways and that's, uh, it's all, it, you get precision is, issues with that. Um, it pushed the quill sideways and I didn't like that. So I came up with that. That's a clamping collar. I made it from 10 mm cold rolled steel. It's bored to, to a close fit on the quill and it slid back here. I slitted it with a slitting saw on the milling machine and then I bolted it on the front of the tailstock. And it's only bolted on in front here and the, the rear of this arrangement is free floating. So with this um, locking bolt up here I can pinch together this, um, this collar and lock it absolutely safe in position and uh, this quill is not going anywhere. It's, um, it's absolutely secured in radial position, also in axial position. This is in my mind one of the better solutions to clamp a quill. Um, that's also what um, Deckel does on their milling machines. They have a collar and this pulls together around the quill. And um, 
their quill also stays in position when you clamp them so there might be something to it and again you can see I just got a lot of travel with that setup and it's uh, pretty rigid and also um, this this collar acts as an uh, additional support for the quill because it's very close fitting and also I can set this uh, just a bit uh, a little tight so it's dragging and when you're drilling a grabby material like brass where it tends to pull in your drill you can tighten this just a bit so it it's dragging and then it doesn't pull your drill into the material so that's the tail stock okay I also welded up this uh, chip pan, which also is, the chip pan is integrated in the machine's base. Let me bring around the camera and I'll show you what I mean. Okay, we're on the tailstock side of my lathe. There is the tailstock, there is the machine's bed. And down here, this is the outer rim of the chip pan. And down here you can see the center support of my lathe and a lot of mess back there. But for now we will concentrate on the stand of this lathe. Um, I welded together two big sections of, um, of a U-channel and I welded on two um, rectangular steel tubing on each side. So I got a pretty stable and stiff base. This goes along the whole length of the lathe, as you can see. And there are um, outriggers. Yeah, get the crap out of the way. Um, there are outriggers with adjusting feet on the end, and that's how I leveled the lathe on this table. But this table is not very good for a lathe. I am going to build a new one pretty soon. And if we go up, we go over, you can see there is the, this is the center support from the base and this is the feet of the, um, the foot of the machine, of the machine's base and there is a 10 millimeter steel plate welded onto the support and that's where the lathe stand on, stands on. And over, over here on the headstock side we have the same. I have the 10 mm steel plate welded onto the center beam and that's where the lathe stands on. Uh, here you can see the rough weldment of the chip pan with the center support. And here we have it in a primed finish and after painting. And here I'm setting up the lathe, the machine's pad onto the, um, onto the support pads. Okay. That's, um, I think that's all I had to tell about this machine and uh, I hope I could um, clarify some of the questions about this machine that were out there. Thank you for watching, see you next time.